This program was sponsored by the Jesse and John Dance Fund. Since 1962, these lectures have been a forum for distinguished scholars of national and international reputation who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. Now most of you know that I'm Janella Butler, I'm Associate Dean and Associate Vice Provost in the Graduate School. And we are here tonight because of a generous gift to the University of Washington. This visiting professorship program was created in 1961 with a bequest from the estate of Mr. John Dance. Mr. Dance came to Seattle in the early days of this century and became a very successful entrepreneur. He is perhaps best known for the chain of movie theaters he developed in this and other states. John Dance was a self-educated man who read widely and liberally. He was fascinated by scientific developments and was particularly interested in the philosophy of humanism. In creating this endowment, his goal was to bring distinguished lecturers and scholars of international reputation to the University of Washington. He particularly wanted those men and women, quote, who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. Mr. Dance's wife, Jessie, shared this vision and augmented the endowment with additional gifts until the time of her death. I would like to welcome a member of the Dance family, Carol Lee Dance. There she is there. Thank you. You've already done what I was going to ask you to do, and that is to join me in expressing appreciation for this invaluable gift to the University of Washington and to the citizens of the region. I think we can applaud again. <laughs> When I um, showed Professor Takaki the introduction prepared, he said, Janella, don't do that. Tell a story. So I said, I wasn't prepared to tell any stories. And so then he jogged my memory, and I told him he might have to push a button and make me sit down. Because I have lots of stories about Ron Takaki. The first that he, I knew his work years ago before I came to the University of Washington, when I sent a student of mine, an African-American student of mine from Smith College who had won a Mellon um, grant to study graduate, to study um, in graduate school, to the University of California at Berkeley. And I told her, go study with Ron Takaki. And she did, and she's completing her work with him now. Then, I've done a lot of work with um, curriculum change. And that was such difficult work with high school teachers and college professors for lots of reasons. But one of the reasons it was so difficult was there was never had not been a history book that told our histories, that connected our histories of the various ethnic groups in this country. So when I saw a different mirror, I was one happy person. And then I was able to meet Ron, I'm not sure when, about 15 years ago or so, because I was able to invite him to come at different times to the University of Washington and other places to give talks about multiculturalism. The other day, I was opening the sofa in our den. And I hadn't, we hadn't opened the sofa since last summer. And a student of mine had, that it, I guess she had visited last year from Spain. And she was, had slept on that sofa. So I was opening it up so that one of the helpers that's taking care of my mother, who was going to spend the night there, could sleep there. And guess what fell out? A different mirror out of the sofa. And so, <laughs> so here it was in the couch all this time. Of course, I had other copies of this. Well, this is a softback copy of it. And I said, well, whose is this? And it was Sylvia's, my Spanish student's copy, all underlined. So the helper saw it, and she said, what a fantastic book. So she started reading it. And then my mother said, oh, I've read that book. My mother, who's 91 years old, you should really check out the part on and then the next helper that came the next day saw it there. So now you see, all these helpers from Swedish Hospital are reading a different mirror. <laughs> and I think that's the joy of Ron Takaki and Ron Takaki's writing. His work is accessible, and most importantly, he's a happy person. He writes about difficult things, but he never lets us forget the joy of life. 
And so with that, I'm very pleased to introduce my very good friend, Ronald Takaki. <laughs> Jonella, I love you too. <laughs> yes. Ah, uh, good evening. Hey, hey, isn't this more than a good evening? Isn't this a great evening? Well, look, look at this immensity of people. All of you are here. Thank you for giving me your time. Um, I'm really glad to be back here on your campus. And I'm so glad I brought the weather of California with me. <laughs> In fact, hey, to be honest, I'm a little bit disappointed in the weather. I brought my raincoat, I brought my umbrella, and I said to Cindy, who met me at the airport, I said, hey, where's the rain? You know, is this or is this not Seattle? Oh, but maybe tomorrow. <laughs> maybe tomorrow. Well, jo Janelle, uh, thanks for that story, it's bit, especially that story about the couch eating my book, A Different Mirror. <laughs> That's the best one yet, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, Steve Sumida, one of my friends from Hawaii, also had his students come in, debate me at the dinner. We had a dinner just before. Uh, this event. And so here were these four students. They said, oh, you know, Professor Sumita said we should come and debate you. And I was standing up. And I said, oh, I better sit down for this debate. <laughs> you know? So I sat down. And then this uh, graduate student, his name is David, okay, he said to the, his fellow students, should we start with the light questions or the heavy questions? <laughs> and then one of them said, start with the heavy questions. And I thought, I wonder what question he'll be throwing at me. And it was a very heavy question. He said, we understand from Professor Sumida that you used to be a surfer in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> so his question was, well, how did a surfer <laughs> turn out to be a scholar like you. And um, I didn't answer his question. I said, hey, all of you are, are into uh, theory, the study of theory and literature. So let's talk about theory. And then I, I gave them my views on theory, you know. And then I said, we could look at surfing in terms of theory, you know, and then explain to them, the epistemological process of surfing. You know, when you're going out there, you're interrogating all these waves, you know, and thinking about the patterns and exactly where you should locate yourself, you know, your site. Huh? And, and, then, <laughs> and then you have to question the way the wave is breaking and so forth. Uh, but I was just entertaining them, you see. Uh, but I was trying to show them, like, you know, how you can even look at something like theory and think of it intellectually. But uh, it's true, I used to be a surfer in Hawaii, uh, even though I might look like a professor tonight with my gray mane. Huh? Uh, but when I was a teenager, I was not academically inclined. And I think some of you out there can identify with me, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to be a serious surfer. In fact, I had a nickname, and my nickname was Ten Toes Takaki, huh? you know. Yeah, my passion or my dream, actually, was to be able to hang 10 on a surfboard as you're shooting that curl. Um, but what happened to me was this, and now I'm going to finally answer David's question. You know, uh, I attended an Episcopalian high school in Hawaii, Iolani High School, and we had a required course in religion. And during my senior year, my teacher's name was Dr. Sunji Nishi, PhD. Uh, and this was the first Asian American, Japanese American, PhD I had ever met in my life up to that point. 
In Hawaii, we had other doctors who were Asian American, but they were all MDs. This one was a PhD. And I was very impressed. Dr. Nishi, PhD. And so I went back home, and I told my mother about Dr. Nishi. My mother was born on a plantation in Hawaii, the Havi Plantation. She only had an eighth grade education. And so I said, Mom, my teacher's name is Dr. Sunji Nishi, PhD. Mom, what's a PhD? And she said, I don't know, but he must be very smart. You know? <laughs> uh, but I think a light went on in my mind. Well, maybe someday I could become Ronald Takaki, PhD. So Dr. Nishi became a role model for me. I wanted to become like another Dr. Nishi. And Dr. Nishi required his students to read a book. And some of you out there may be familiar with this book. It's entitled The Screw Tape Letters, written by C.S. Lewis. And these are imagined letters that the chief devil uh, named Screw Tape had written to his nephew, Wormwood on Earth, giving Wormwood instructions on how to entice and trap Christians into committing sin so that these Christians would think, oh, this is a Christian thing to do and to kill, okay? So we had to read a letter a week, and then we had to write a letter a week. And a relationship developed between Dr. Nishi and me through my essays and through his marginal comments. And Dr. Nishi was a good teacher. He wrote extensive marginal comments. And he would ask me epistemological questions. Hey, how's that for a 50 cent word? Epistemology. Uh, let, me, let me define it for you quickly. Epistemology is a theory of knowledge. Epistemology asks the question, how do you know you know what you know? How do you know you know what you know? So here Dr. Nishi would scribble in the margins. How do you know this is true? How do you know you know about this subject? And I'd have to reread what I had written. I would think, gee, maybe I don't know. You know? <laughs> maybe I have to rethink this one. You know? But uh, he, he not only gave criticism, but he was also a good teacher in that he gave praise, too. Uh, frequently, he would write good uh, or important point. Uh, or I like this idea. And every now and then, he would write insightful. Well, during the second semester of my senior year, as I was walking across campus, and it was late in the second semester, I would say it was about April, okay? As I was walking across campus, all of a sudden, Dr. Nishi stopped me. He said, Ronald, Ronald, wait a minute. I have a question I'd like to ask you. He said, Ronald, I think it would be good for you to go away to college. It'll be good for your personal growth and for your intellectual development. There's this fine liberal arts college in Ohio called the College of Worcester. Would you like to go to the College of Worcester? And I blurted out, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to tell him that, oh, I don't want to leave the surf. But, <laughs> but the main reason was that I thought, Ohio, oh, that's so far away. I had never been off the island of Oahu. I could just imagine going all the way to Ohio in the Midwest. So I said no. But then Dr. Nishi said, would it be OK, Ronald, if I wrote to the college to tell them about you? And I said, OK. And I walked away, and I forgot completely about this conversation. Well, a month later, I received a letter from the dean of the College of Worcester. And the letter read, Dear Mr. Takaki, you have been accepted to the College of Worcester. <laughs> but please fill out the application form. <laughs> this dean hadn't even received my transcript yet. And my GPA was pretty average. But that's a problem with GPA. It's grade point average. So here I was getting good grades during my senior year, but my average was pretty average. <laughs> but 
you see, uh, when, when universities, including this university, uh, uses the GPA mechanically, it has to realize that that GPA doesn't give you an accurate snapshot of the student at the time of applying for admission. Okay? You know, we should look at the grades during the senior year. Huh? We forget about those C's when you were a freshman. Oh, if you like that, okay, <laughs> listen to this next one. This dean hadn't received my SAT scores yet. And my SAT scores were also pretty average, pretty mediocre. In fact, low, you know? <laughs> I can't remember what it really was, but it was not impressive, okay? But one thing we do know for a fact about SATs is that SAT scores correlate with family incomes. They rise together. Okay? And for years, I've been advocating the abolition of the SAT requirement for our application to, to the University of California. And guess what? Just last fall, the president of the University of California, Dick Atkinson, recommended the elimination of the SAT. And the faculty is on the verge of approving it. Imagine, how's that? Get rid of the SATs. Yes. Just think how much money our brothers and sisters who will be applying for college admission will save, okay? Not only for the SAT costs, but also for all those Kaplan uh, costs, right? <laughs> but the other thing is that now these teachers can teach the content, you know, rather than teach the tests. So what happened? I accepted. I went to Worcester. And it was intimidating. It was far away. Well, it was a long plane ride, you know. We, I mean, there weren't any 747s in those days. This was 1957, prop-driven planes, you know. And I can remember going down into Worcester, in small town, Ohio, population 17,000, you know, right in the middle of cornfields, huh? Um, uh, I, I missed the ocean. I missed the mountains. But also, the other thing I found is that Worcester had a student body of 1,000 students. And there were only five Asian students there. Okay? And I can remember walking across campus, and my fellow students would ask me questions like, how long have you been in this country? And where did you learn to speak English? You know, Asian American students today tell me, oh, we still get asked those questions. OK, yeah. And that was over 40 years ago. Think about it, you know, when it happened to me. But I could see that my fellow students could not, did not, see me as an American, you know? I didn't look like an American to them, and my name, Takaki, didn't have an American sound to it, okay? Uh, so I did feel like a foreigner. I felt like a stranger, even though my grandfather had come here in 1886, before many European immigrants, you see? Uh, and I can remember feeling very homesick at Worcester, um, and feeling like I was a stranger uh, that I did not belong. I was not part of the Worcester community. But now when I look back at my Worcester experience, I realize that it was not the fault of my fellow students that they could not and did not see me as a fellow American. It was the fault of the curriculum. The curriculum. Think about it. What had they learned? Well, Think about yourself. What had you learned, say, in high school or even in college, in courses called United States history? What did you learn, say, about Asian Americans or Puerto Ricans or Chicanos or the native peoples of this continent or African Americans? In the curriculum, you have embedded in it so that faculty and students aren't even thinking about it. Uh, that's what makes it so powerful. You have embedded in it what can be called the master narrative of American history. The master narrative of American history. And we're all familiar with this narrative. It's a story, the pervasive, powerful, but also mistaken story that this nation was settled by European immigrants 
and that American means white or European in ancestry. Now, this master narrative of American history at Worcester was benign, okay? These students meant no harm to me. They weren't trying to denigrate me, uh, to insult me. Um, they're, they're, the master narrative for them was benign. It was what could be called uh, innocent ignorance. How's that for alliteration, huh? <laughs> innocent ignorance. Okay. But this master narrative can also be malignant. It can lead to exclusion. It can lead to internment. It can lead to racial profiling, like what happened to Wen Ho Lee, who was incarcerated, kept in solitary confinement for 11 months. And after 9-11, it can lead to hate crimes against Asians from Pakistan and from India. Now, this master narrative also contained, however, a contradiction. It also included equality as a self-evident truth. Okay. Now, you're wondering, you think, Professor Takaki, I'm wondering, why did you tell this story about this Dr. Nishi and Wooster? Well, let me answer that question by just sharing with you a quote from Leslie Selko's novel, Ceremony. You know, this is a novel about a Pueblo, Laguna Pueblo Indian, who comes back from the Pacific War. But ultimately, it's a book about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, okay. ceremony. And ceremony opens with this poem. And the poem goes this way. Our stories aren't just for entertainment, you know. Don't be fooled, okay? So here I told you the story about Dr. Nishi and College of Worcester. But there was a reason why I told you this story, you know, not just to entertain you, to make you laugh, although you're right, Janela, you know, I am like uh, a happy pessimist, huh? It's the Takaki laugh. <laughs> but there were two points that I wanted to make by telling you these opening stories. One is that I wanted to introduce you to the concept of epistemology, the methodology. How do we know we know what we know? Okay. Secondly, I wanted to introduce you or to highlight one of the themes of of the lecture that I'll be presenting tonight. And this is the theme of the master narrative of American history. For my lecture on why multiculturalism matters in America, I'd like to offer some scholarship from my book entitled Hiroshima, Why America Dropped the Atomic Bomb. Here we are at the beginning of the 21st century, and here we find ourselves swept into a frightening and perplexing world of conflicts. Okay. Frightening and perplexing. What happened on 9-11 at the World Trade Center and at the Pentagon was an atrocity. And the individuals responsible for this horror must be brought to justice. But we need to ask ourselves two questions. One, what means do we choose to punish the perpetrators of 
those heinous actions? You know, what means do we choose to punish them? Second, where will the means we choose, where will the means we choose take Americans and the people of the rest of the world? Okay. So what means do we choose and where will the means we choose take us as Americans and as people in the world? Now, I'm a historian, and what I'd like to do is this, to help us reflect on these two questions, on means, what means and where will the means take us. I would like to revisit a time in history when our nation was in crisis and at war. That war began for the United States suddenly, suddenly, on December 7th, 1941. Before December 7th, before that December 7th, the American people did not want to get involved in the wars already underway in Asia and in Europe. But on that day, December 7th, Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor shocked Americans and transformed them instantly into a people united, solidly united, behind President Roosevelt's call for a declaration of war. It would be war that would be conducted until victory. Now, within months after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, 120,000 Japanese Americans on the West Coast, right here, including right here in Washington, were evacuated and imprisoned in internment camps. Two-thirds of them were born in the United States. They were citizens by birth, and yet it didn't matter. They were still taken away. Okay. But what's overlooked in this story of internment usually, is the fact, the fact that 150,000 Japanese Americans in Hawaii, myself among them, were not evacuated and were not interned. And this raises the question, why? Why were Japanese Americans, 120,000 of them on the West Coast, evacuated and interned? And why is it that Japanese Americans, 150,000 of them in Hawaii, where military action in fact had occurred, why is it that they were not interned? Why? Well, there are many factors, okay? But let me identify what I would call pivotal, a pivotal factor. A pivotal factor on the West Coast was the presence of General John DeWitt. He was commander of the West Coast Defense. And he was the one who initiated that report and that recommendation that went to Washington and that be was signed then as Executive Order 9066 by Roosevelt. But this General DeWitt declared that these Japanese Americans were Japanese. He said, and here I'm quoting him, he said, a Jap is a Jap is a Jap. So it didn't matter what generation you were, second generation, born in this country, you still inherited loyalty to the emperor of Japan. And on that basis, then, he made this recommendation for evacuation and internment. But what about Hawaii? Why wasn't I interned? Okay, and my family. Well, a pivotal factor in Hawaii was the presence of General Delos Emmons, the military governor of Hawaii. You know, uh, most history books don't even mention General Emmons, but in my view, he is a hero. Emmons received pressure from Washington 
to intern Japanese Americans in Hawaii. Okay? But he resisted those pressures. And in fact, he even spoke out publicly. He issued a public announcement in Hawaii. He said that he had, and here I'm quoting that public announcement, he had, quote, no intention to operate mass concentration camps. We must remember that this is America, and we must do things the American way, unquote. How's that for a policymaker, huh? He remembered, he respected the Constitution of the United States of America that guarantees all persons in the United States the right to due process of the law. General Emmons showed that patriotism meant doing the right thing constitutionally. Patriotism meant doing the right thing constitutionally. It was patriotic to guarantee the rights of Japanese Americans in Hawaii. He said, we have no intention to operate mass concentration camps. The war began with Japan's bombing of Pearl Harbor. And the war ended with America's atomic bombing of Hiroshima. Now actually, most of us know very little about why this country dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. But again, you know, like those Worcester students, it's not your fault. You know, what did we learn, say, in our history courses, our textbooks? What did we learn from the media, like Time Magazine, you know, the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima? Or what did we learn from that Enola Gay exhibit at the Smithsonian, you know, that was shut down by the pressures from the veterans group and then revised? Actually, our top military leaders, our top military leaders did not support Truman's decision to drop that atomic bomb. Okay. And they included eminently respected top military leaders like General Dwight D. Eisenhower. In July of 1945, as Secretary of War was making his way, as Henry L. Stimson was making his way to Potsdam, he met with Eisenhower. The war in Europe was over, and General Eisenhower told Henry L. Stimson that, and here I'm quoting, Japan was already defeated. This is July of 1945. Japan was already defeated, and the United States should not use that, and here I'm quoting, that horrible new weapon against Japan. He said there was no military necessity to use that horrible weapon. In the Pacific, General Douglas MacArthur believed also that Japan had already lost the war in July and would surrender soon after Russia entered the war in early August. In fact, General MacArthur was giving instructions to his troops to prepare for the occupation, not to prepare for the invasion. He thought that an invasion itself would not have to take place. MacArthur thought that there was, and here I'm quoting, no military necessity, unquote, for the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Now, in view of the fact that Eisenhower and MacArthur did not support the decision to drop the atomic bomb, we have to ask the question and try to answer the question, why then, why then did Truman make the decision he made? Why did Truman make that decision? Well, if we had President Truman here today, this is what Truman would say. He would say, Professor Takaki, I made that decision and I made the right decision 
to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima in order to avoid an invasion, an invasion of Japan and to save half a million American military lives. That's what Truman would say, okay, if you were here. And if Dr. Nishi were here, he would say, Ron, he would say, Ronald, yes, Ronald, <laughs> we have to ask the president, or you have to ask yourself the epistemological question, how do we know we know what we know about what Truman is saying to us? Half a million. Well, for this book on Hiroshima, I had to trace you know, that half a million because Time Magazine, in, uh, uh, five, uh, uh, in 1995, on the 50th anniversary, had an article saying, we did it in order to save half a million American military lives. Okay, so it's become part of the mythology about why we dropped the atomic bomb, to save half a million American lives. But then we have to ask, well, how do we know this is true? How do we know it, okay? Well, when you follow it back, that's what scholars like to do, you know? Yeah, we like to follow, follow the, 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 the statements. Follow it back, it takes us to Truman himself. He said it, but when did he say it? Okay, he said it in his memoirs, okay? The Truman memoirs. And I always like to look at when a book is published, you know? Guess when the Truman memoirs were published? 1955. Ten years after the drama of the atomic bomb on his show, now Truman says, I did it to save half a million American lives. Okay, well, one thing I have to say that's great about our government, oh, I can say a lot of great things about our government, actually. Uh, but one thing I can say that's great about our American government is that it has declassified our military documents, top secret military documents of World War II. Japan still has not opened up its archives, okay? So we don't know about Japan's role in the war in terms of official documents. But in this case, you know, I went to the National Archives. I was able to get like top secret documents, like the minutes of the meetings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And this is, you know, like mind blowing. You know, you go there and you say, wow, it says top secret, you know? <laughs> and then it stands out, declassified. So, you know, Truman said half a million. Well, the planning committee of the invasion prepared a report submitted to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, okay? We can look at that planning committee report. We can even go to the Xerox machine, Xerox it. So I have it at home now, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but this is what that planning committee said. It had an estimate. For, for casualties, for an invasion of Japan. Uh, and its estimate, in terms of deaths, was not half a million. It was 40,000, right there, 40,000. And the thing about Truman was that he reads these reports. He, he, he's known as a very careful reader of reports. Not only did Truman read that report, he met with the Joint Chiefs of Staff at a meeting in July to discuss that report. And we have the minutes of that meeting. And it's been declassified. So I was able to read those minutes. And guess what I found in those minutes? Here we have these generals and these uh, admirals talking about how the invasion will be different than the uh, invasion of Okinawa. They said, Oh, you know, J Japan can't, doesn't even have gasoline. It can't move its troops around and wouldn't know where the landings would take place. And they said, Japan is running out of ammunition. Japan has no air force. It's defenseless, okay? So they said, it would be fairly easy, you know, to take uh, Kyushu first and then to invade the mainland. And they used language like this. And here I'm quoting from the from that, that meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff with Truman present, they said the, the, the estimates for the number of men killed are light. They use that term, light. They also said the, the, the cost in terms of human life of American soldiers would be, quote unquote, relatively inexpensive. 
Okay, so they're saying, oh, it's only 40000 relatively inexpensive. And on the basis of those low estimates, Truman authorized the invasion of Japan. He said, go ahead then. Okay. So, you know, uh, I'm not arguing for or against Truman. I'm just presenting the facts here. Okay. Now, but still this brings us to the question that, well, Truman authorized the invasion. Well, then, why did Truman decide to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Now, what happened was complicated, so you're going to have to follow me, okay? You know, uh, but uh, I think you will find that it is worth the effort, uh, and I'll explain why, at the end of this lecture, why I think it's worth the effort to understand what happened then. At that time, when Truman met with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Joint Chiefs of Staff had already determined that Japan had military loss to the war. This was in July. The Battle of Okinawa was decisive. That ended in June, June 20th, okay? The US Navy had a complete blockade of Japan. There was no movement of goods in and out of Japan. The US Air Force had complete control of the skies. It dominated the skies. There was no air defenses in Japan and they were just bombing at will, okay? Japan's electrical grid had been completely destroyed. So it was, they were, you have cities without electricity. Japan, as I pointed out, had little gasoline, and the Japanese people were starving, okay? The Japanese people were also demoralized. How do we know this? The US intelligence had spies in Japan, and they were reporting that the Japanese people themselves are ready to surrender. We also had been intercepting messages sent from Tokyo to Moscow asking Russia to facilitate a negotiated peace. They said that we have a number of conditions for a negotiated peace, but there's one condition that's non-negotiable. Japan must be allowed to keep the emperor system. This is a non-negotiable condition for peace. So our military intelligence had been intercepting and decoding these messages. So Washington knew that Japan was ready to surrender in July, but it just wanted to keep the emperor, OK? So the Joint Chiefs of Staff sent Truman a recommendation saying, let Japan keep the emperor. Let Japan keep the emperor. So Henry L. Stimson, who was Secretary of War, Secretary of War then was like our Secretary of Defense today, okay? He was like Rumsfeld. Henry L. Stimson went to Potsdam, prepared to insert into that Potsdam Declaration, would be the declaration that would be issued to Japan, insert a provision that would allow Japan to keep the emperor system, okay? At least in the form, say, of a constitutional monarchy. So, Stimson went to Potsdam. On his way to Potsdam, he met with Eisenhower. Then he went to Potsdam, and he participated in the writing of the draft of the Potsdam Declaration. And he made sure that his provision to allow Japan to keep the emperor system was there in the draft. Well, a few days later, when the final version was issued, Stimson looked at the final version, and he was shocked shocked to discover that his one provision had been deleted, deleted. It was deleted, it had been deleted by Secretary of State James Burns, the new Secretary of State who became Secretary of State only in July, July 4th, and by Harry Truman. Harry Truman approved it, okay. So, when that declaration was issued, it said, the surrender must be unconditional surrender. And this insistence made inevitable the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, because Japan rejected that Potsdam Declaration. They said, we will not accept the Potsdam Declaration. And so the train had left that station for the dropping of the bomb. So when we say, why did Truman 
make that decision to drop the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. We have to look at this more specific question. Why did Truman insist so rigidly on unconditional surrender? Why did he insist so rigidly? And why did he go over the head of Henry L. Stimson and agree with Burns? Okay. Well, one factor, one factor was the coming Cold War. You see, by insisting on unconditional surrender, you delay the end of the war. Okay? And by delaying the end of the war, you have more time then to test that weapon, because that weapon still had to be tested in Almagoro in New Mexico. You see, you know, the Manhattan Project was madly assembling that, that weapon, but they didn't know whether or not it would work. So we, the United States needed time to test that weapon. And also, we needed time. Oh, I'm sorry, we're saying, I'm saying we, but our government needed time to deliver that weapon. Okay? So, unconditional surrender was a, uh, gave extra time to do these things. So, so, the Cold War theory, and this is the theory that's advanced by Gar Arpovitz in his book, Atomic Diplomacy. The, the, the real target, according to this then, theory or I explanation, was of the atomic bomb was not Japan, but it was Russia. It was Russia, okay? That the United States would sh unleash this weapon against the Japanese people in order to show Stalin that we had this terrible weapon, this terrible weapon, and to tell Stalin, don't mess with the United States. We have this weapon, we can destroy you, okay? That mushroom cloud, in other words, would send a message to Stalin to intimidate Stalin. Now, what do I think of this Cold War factor? It is one factor. It, I think it was the motive for Secretary of State James Burns. Okay? In fact, we have evidence that this was his motive. Because, you see, after Germany surrendered in June, many of the Manhattan Project scientists said, oh, we don't need to continue working on the Manhattan Project. Because the purpose of that Manhattan Project initially was to develop a nuclear weapon as a defensive weapon against Germany, because we had evidence that German scientists were developing an atomic bomb. And so Roosevelt then authorized the Manhattan Project. But it was to be a, as a defensive weapon. So now that Germany was no longer an enemy, now that Germany was no longer a potential nuclear threat, you had scientists like uh, Leo Szilard you know, the Chicago-based Manhattan Project scientists saying, hey, let's stop working on the Manhattan Project. And Szilard was, was the one who like, conceptualized this idea of splitting the atom, went down then to South Carolina after he learned that James Burns had been appointed Secretary of State. You see, that was in July 4th. Szilard went down to Charleston, and he met with James Burns, and he said, look, we should stop, we should stop working on this project. We don't need the atomic bomb. And uh, James Burns said, no, we're going to continue the Manhattan Project. He said, I know that Japan has already lost this war. This is July. I know that Japan has already lost this war. But we do not want Japan to surrender yet until we can test this weapon and then we, until we can deploy this weapon against Japan in order to show Stalin that we have the bomb. And Szilard was shocked when he heard that. He was really upset. And think about it. Here, this State Department minister, you know, this secretary, was willing to waste, to kill, you know, hundreds of thousands of Japanese women and children in order to send a message to Stalin. Okay? He didn't think of them as people. So Szilard went back to Chicago and he circulated a petition asking his fellow Manhattan Project scientists to stop the work, okay? And they were going to send this petition to the White House. And they were trying to get that pet petition down into uh, Alma Girl. But Leslie Groves, who was director of the Manhattan Institute, just shut off all the scientists down in Alma Girl. There was no communication between Chicago scientists and the Almagro, so the Almagro scientists didn't know that there was a revolt underway. 
that there was this petition to ask Truman to stop work on the Manhattan Project. So the Manhattan Project continued then in Almaguro, and the bomb was successfully tested. So that was, that was Burns' motivation. Was this the motivation for Truman? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think Truman was doing this in order to ex give himself more time in order to intimidate Stalin with the bomb. Um, I'd like to read to you from a document that historians, did, no one knew about until after Harry Truman died. After Truman died, a historian working in the Truman archives stumbled across a, a thin manuscript with Truman's handwriting. And the dates were like June and July of 1945. So Truman was writing a diary. And we call this now the secret Potsdam diary. So we know now what Truman himself was thinking, you see, in his diary. And this is what he wrote on J June 7th, 1945, which you know, would suggest that he wasn't thinking about the Cold War or initiating the Cold War by dropping the atomic bomb on Japan. This is what he wrote on June 7th, 1945. He was already president of the United States. You know, he, he, he suddenly became president on April 12th, okay? He said, I am not afraid of Russia. And here I'm quoting, I am not afraid of Russia. They've always been our friends. And I can't see any reason why they shouldn't always be. You know, Got to remember, Russia was an ally. So here Truman said, they've always been our friends, and I can't see any reason why they shouldn't always be. The people in Russia evidently like their government, or they wouldn't die for it. I like ours, so let's get along, wrote Truman in his diary. Okay. By the way, that diary after it was found in, in uh, like 1972 has been published, so you can find it in your university bookstore, okay, the Truman Diary. But Truman deferred to Burns, okay, at Potsdam. Now, why did Truman defer to Burns is the question. Well, this brings me to a second factor now. The first factor, okay, uh, was uh, the Cold War. But I'm saying that was the factor for James Burns. It wasn't a factor for Truman. The second factor now, James Burns. Why did Truman defer to Burns? This second factor was this. Truman was very insecure when he began his presidency, okay? He was called at that time the accidental president, the accidental president, okay? Now, what, what did newspapers mean when they described Truman as the accidental president, when he suddenly became president when Roosevelt died on April 12, 1945. Well, you see, Truman was nominated to be the vice presidential running mate in 1944, when Roosevelt was running for the third term. And at the Democratic Convention, there was a deadlock for the selection of the vice presidential candidate, a deadlock between a northern liberal, Henry Wallace, and a southern conservative. James Burns of South Carolina. And Truman, who was a senator from Missouri, uh, and he became a senator through the Missouri political machine. Okay? Harry Truman went to the Democrat convention in order to nominate his buddy, James Burns of South Carolina, a conservative. So here he was, you know, uh, at the Democratic Convention. And then upstairs in the hotel room, you know, Roosevelt was consulting with his staff, and they said, look, there's a terrible deadlock between Wallace and Burns. What are we going to do? We, we can't let this deadlock divide the Democratic Party. And Roosevelt was kind of worried, you know, oh, I'm trying to run for the third term. Huh? And Roosevelt said, no, we, we, can't, we can't let this deadlock continue. And then somebody said, well, we're going to have to find a third alternative. And then somebody said, well, what about that senator from Missouri? You know, what, what's his name? Harry something, you know? Oh, yeah, Truman. And Roosevelt said, get, get him on the phone. So Truman, uh, I'll, I'll show you what he was doing. 
He was on the convention of the floor, you know, of the Democratic convention. And this is Truman remembering that moment. He said, I was eating my hot dog, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then somebody brought this telephone to me and said, you, you have a call here. And then I, I picked up the phone, and at the other end, I heard this voice. Harry, this is Franklin. I want you to be my running mate. And Truman said, I had to gobble up my hot dog quickly, OK? And he, he was stunned you know, that he had been selected by Roosevelt to be the running mate. So he ran with Roosevelt. Roosevelt was reelected, and he became then the vice president. But, but Truman, and we know this from his letters to his wife, you know, was very uh, anxious and insecure about being the vice president. Uh, he said, like, I'm not qualified you know, to, to be in Washington like this. And he was really afraid that Roosevelt would die because he said to his wife, I, I, I have no experience in foreign policy. You know, I'm just a senator from Missouri. What do I know about foreign policy? And um, then, you know, so here was Truman, insecure. He thought he wasn't qualified to be president. And then when Roosevelt died, suddenly Truman became the president. And he became the target of jokes. People were saying, Harry who, you know, for the new president? Or, or who the hell is Truman, OK? And then the one that hurt him the most was the charge, the description, that Harry Truman was the little man in the White House. The little man in the White House. Here, Truman had to fill the big shoes of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the greatly, immensely loved president. So here he was, an insecure president, OK, in the White House now. And this brings us to a third factor. Now, Truman had a an unhappy childhood, OK? Um, at the age of six, he started to go blind and had to wear these thick glasses. And he could not play baseball. And here he was out in Missouri, and he couldn't play baseball. And the neighborhood kids would call him sissy, sissy, sissy. And this really hurt, you know, cut him to the bone. Huh? And um, his mother even told him, Harry, you should have been born a girl, you know? How would you like it if your mother told you if you were a boy? You should have been born a girl, you know? Yeah. Um, so Truman retreated into the library, uh, into the world of books. Um, he then fought in World War I, and then he uh, tried to be a businessman. Uh, he, he had a clothing store, which went bankrupt. Uh, so he didn't have, you know, much uh, good self-esteem, okay? But then he was able to be elected as a judge, and then with the, with the uh, political machines, he was able then to be elected to the Senate, okay? But when he became president, he wore his masculinity on his sleeves, you know? What do you mean? We have in America what can be called the culture of masculinity, you know, how you have to be American, if your male is to be a man, OK? So Truman was going to be a man in the White House, OK? In fact, he, 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 he displayed his masculinity with slogans. Like, he had a slogan in the Oval Office of the White House behind that desk. And the slogan read, what did that slogan read? The buck stops here. The buck stops here. OK, let me ask you a question. Do you know what he meant by the buck? What is the buck? The buck stops here. What is the buck? You said the buck stops here, right? Yeah, what is the buck? The decision. Uh, the decision stops here? What's the buck? I do that to my Berkeley students, you know? Yeah. An animal? What animal? A male deer, huh? What male deer? 
male deer, what? The horn of a male deer? The horn of a male deer. The horn of a male deer. Hey, strike that out. <laughs> All male deers are horny. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not a male deer. Okay. <laughs> it's the buckhorn. The buckhorn. And what, what, what did he mean when he said the buck stops here? You see, it comes out of the west, out of the frontier. You see, these tough frontiersmen would play cards. They would gamble. And at the gambling table, they would use a hunting knife that had a buckhorn handle. Okay. And they would pass that hand, the buckhorn handle around. And where that knife stopped, that would be the dealer. And the dealer would control the cards, OK? So in other words, you're in control if the buck stopped there. So when Truman said, the buck stops here, he was telling us, he was telling America a lot about himself, you know, that he is a tough American, OK? The buck stops here. But here's a guy like who was suffering from this past, you know, where he was called a sissy and all that. Huh? Now, remember how people also called him the little man in the White House. That's the one that made him bristle the most. Truman thought that he was a short man. He was five feet eight, and he thought he was short, you know. Like, I'm five feet six. But I don't think I'm short, OK? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but Truman thought he was short. And you know this affected him. And it affected his decisions for foreign policy, OK? When he went to Potsdam, he was going to meet with Churchill and Stalin. He was going to fill in for Roosevelt. And the three of them had been known as the big three, the big three, you know, Churchill, Stalin, Roosevelt. And imagine if you were Truman now going to Potsdam, you're going to become part of the big three. So Truman went to Potsdam and knew he had a problem with Stalin because the Red Army was in Poland, okay? Uh, and Stalin had a reason why the Red Army was in Poland and was not going to get out of the Red, uh, Poland. Because Stalin said, we've been invaded too many times from Europe, so we will need Poland as a buffer. We will not be invaded again. We lost 20 million people by the Nazi invasion. So Stalin was determined. It wasn't Russian expansionism. It was that they were going to build this buffer zone through Poland, and the Red Army would be there. And so Truman went to Potsdam to, try to, to demand that Stalin withdraw the Red Army from Poland. But and here we have Truman's diary, OK? The diary, you know, it tells a lot. He's worried about this, you know, meeting with Stalin, because he thinks of Stalin as one of the big three. And he thought that Stalin was a tall man, OK? You know, Stalin looks kind of big and tall. He walks into this room, you know, for the first time, and he notices that Stalin is shorter than he is. <laughs> and for Truman to note that in his diary tells you something. He said, oh, he's shorter than I am. You see, Stalin, whenever he would have his pictures taken with his generals, would stand on bricks, you see? Yeah. So this surprised Truman. But it also pleased him. Oh, he's shorter than I am. But anyway. Uh, you know, Stalin said to Truman, look, we have some differences, you know, and I'm going to tell you uh, what they are. And what, what did Truman say? Shoot, shoot, you know? Uh, so Stalin told him the Red Army, you know, is going to stay in Poland. We will never be invaded again from Europe. Um, and Truman then retreats, you know, to his room that night, and he writes in his diary. He says, that Stalin is tough. He came on strong, you know? He, he pushed me around today. But he said, Stalin doesn't know something I know. Stalin doesn't know something I know. And then that night, the message came in. Almagoro, it is a success. So he writes in his diary, 
I have 20,000 tons of TNT. But he's not going to tell Stalin yet. Okay? He goes into that room the next day. Winston Churchill, this is now from Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill noticed, noticed that the day before, like Truman had Stalin push him around. But he said that next day, Truman came in with a kind of gait, you know, in his walk. Huh? <laughs> and, and he noticed that. Because Truman knew that he had 20,000 tons of TNT. You know, he, he was now the possessor of the most powerful weapon of all of human history. And so he started to dictate to Stalin the terms, you see. Stalin already knew that Almagro was a success. His spies had already told him that. So Stalin knew what was happening. But Stalin still said, no, we're not withdrawing from Poland. But Truman also wrote something else in his diary. He said, I can now, I have the means now to demand unconditional surrender from Japan. And I stood up like a man against Stalin. I'm going to stand up like a man against Japan. Unconditional surrender. So here was Burns now saying, let's delete that one provision. Okay, because Burns went to delay the end of the war. And here was Truman now in possession of the atomic bomb. He said, let's delete that one provision that would allow Japan to keep the emperor. He demanded unconditional surrender in that Potsdam Declaration. And the people of this enemy nation belong to a different race. And this brings us to a fourth factor. Okay. We have to place Truman within his context. His grandparents were pioneers. In fact, they fought Indians. They helped clear the West, clear Missouri. His grandfather led wagon trains to California, from Missouri to California. Uh, so the, so the, the Trumans personified Frederick Jackson Turner's thesis, the significance of the frontier in American history. Yeah. The Trumans were also Southerners, and they were slave holders before the Civil War. Okay. And the Trumans, as a family, used the term, the N-word, again and again and again. Okay, it was just part of their vocabulary. Um, Truman's mother supported the Confederacy. And after Truman became president and she visited her son, the president, in the White House, she refused to sleep in the Lincoln bedroom. She told her son, quote, it was a good thing when Lincoln was shot, unquote. Now, I'm the kind of historian that likes to look at um, personal letters, okay? Uh, maybe some of you have read my book, uh, Iron Cages, you know? I study Jefferson's political philosophy by examining his love letters to Maria Causeway, okay? I think love letters can tell you a lot about a person, you know? But I mean, it's part of our, our, ourself, right? So here, I'm, I'm reading now Truman's letters to his future wife, Bess. And I came across this one letter, June 22nd, 1911. Okay. He's courting Bess. And he writes, and here I'm quoting, I think one man is as good as another as long as he's honest and decent and not a nigger or a Chinaman. Uncle Will, this is Uncle Will who fought in the Confederate Army. Uncle Will says that the Lord made a white man of dust, a nigger from mud, then threw up what was left, and it came down a Chinaman. He does hate Chinese and Japs. So do I. It is race prejudice, I guess, but I am strongly of the opinion that Negroes ought to live in Africa yellow men in Asia, and white men in Europe and America." Unquote. There you have it, the master narrative of American history in the mind of a young man expressed in a letter, love letter to his wife, to his future wife. Now, during World War II, this is many years later, 
Truman's negative feeling toward the quote-unquote Japs would become a racialized rage against the Japs, meaning the entire Japanese people, okay? In the case of the European war, it was always against the Nazis, not the German people, okay? But in the Pacific War, you had a racialized war. It was a war against the Japs. Would be, so Truman's negative feelings toward the Japs would become a racialized rage against the Japs, seeking revenge for Pearl Harbor. Shortly after the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, Truman justified the destruction. In a private letter he wrote, and here I'm quoting, nobody is more disturbed over the unwarranted attack by the Japanese on Pearl Harbor. The only language they seem to understand is one that we have been using to bombard them. When you have to deal with a beast, you have to treat him as a beast. Unquote. So he was remembering Pearl Harbor, and he was pursuing fiercely a rage for revenge for Pearl Harbor, and he had reduced the enemy to a beast, and the enemy included the people as well. So Truman dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, and thus on that hot August morning of August 6th, 70,000 people were killed instantly. On the ground level that morning, Naoko Masuoka was on a school trip. She was on her way to a trip. And she remembered, there was a blinding flash, and I lost consciousness. Sanai Kano also saw a sudden flash of light. She said, I ran out of the house at the river. I saw people who were burned black and were crying for water. The force of the blast had sent millions of shrapnel shards in all directions. Yoshihiro Kimura asked, where is mother, he asked his father. And his father answered, she is dead. Then she noticed that a nail five inches long had struck into mother's head. And then it began to rain, and it came down black. But even after the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, the Japanese government still refused to surrender, except on the condition of allowing it to keep the emperor system. And after the destruction of Nagasaki, Truman confided to Henry Wallace, who was a member of the cabinet. And this is what he told Henry Wallace after, the day after Nagasaki. He said, the thought, and here I'm quoting, the thought of wiping out another 100,000 people was too horrible. And he said, I don't like the idea of killing all those kids. So Truman realized, he understood what he had done, and he felt awful about what he had done. And, and here, when I was doing research on Truman, you know, I didn't expect to find you know, a person who would be so compassionate and so complicated and also so conflicted, okay? Because you don't get this image from reading David McCullough, okay? You know, you know. But here was this Truman who, who, who privately now was able to, to, to tell you know, a cabinet member how he felt that horrible. And he knew he was killing all those kids. Uh, but he kept his feelings private. He would never, never acknowledge them publicly for the rest of his life. Instead, he would say, Again and again, I did it, I did it for the right reason. I did it to avoid an invasion. He would then even like invent a number, half a million American lives. And the thing about Truman is that he kept saying this again and again as if it were a mantra, okay? Now, after Nagasaki, and after he had told Henry Wallace about his regret, 
he ordered that the third atomic bomb not be dropped. There was a third bomb ready to go. And he was persuaded by Henry L. Stimson to accept a conditional surrender, to let Japan keep the emperor system. And here you had two, two cabinet members, the Secretary of Defense, Jimmy Burns, who's saying, let's, let's continue the bombing. Let's go all the way, total victory. Let's force them to surrender unconditionally. And then here you have Henry L. Stimson, Secretary of War, saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know? What are we doing here? Is this really what we want to do, to continue killing women and children? And Truman then said, no, we, we don't want to continue the bombing. So he said, third bomb will not be dropped. I so order. So the United States in the end accepted a conditional surrender from Japan. And Japan today still has an emperor, OK? Just think what would have happened had the United States negotiated earlier in July a conditional surrender with Japan. Just think what would have happened had we negotiated the surrender before the successful explosion at Almagoro. You wouldn't have had a Hanford, Washington, where radioactive contamination will be there for the next 10,000 years, if you can imagine that kind of time. Imagine what would have happened had the United States negotiated earlier a conditional surrender, which is what happened in the end. But history did not happen that way. This brings us to the end of my lecture and to the question, how will history happen today? How will history happen today? Of course, the present is very different in many ways from the past we have just revisited. But that past urges us to remember Dr. Nishi's lesson on epistemology. You know, how do we know we know what is happening today in the United States, in the Middle East, and in Central Asia? You know, what choices will we make? And I mean we, because our government is part of we. What choices will we make? And will the consequences of our choices be the ones that we will want to have for our children, our grandchildren, and the vast diversity of the world's humanity? Are these the choices? What choices will we make? And what consequences will we want to have? I don't have the answers. But I wanted to share with you, you know, my research on a moment in the past that I think urges us to think more deeply about the world, the society we live in today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I would like to. Yeah, I would like to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think that we, I think you've made a profoundly important point. And I think that we need to aim our analysis directly at the culture of masculinity. And I want to ask you how you think we can go about doing that. Well, you know, uh, we <laughs> see it everywhere around us, huh? But. Uh, I know we have students here who study literature. Huh? In fact, I met with about four of them. You know, uh, your students, Janella. Yeah. Uh, language is important. Language unveils, unshrouds so much. You know, as I was trying to say, you know, when Truman said the buck stops here, let's analyze it. Okay, we found out 
connects him to the frontier. It connects him to a whole matrix. Huh? So when a political leader uses language that illuminates this culture of masculinity, you know, you have to ask, well, what is the thinking behind that language? Um, and is that thinking the kind of thinking that would be useful for the making of foreign policy? Okay, yeah. Um, and I think you know what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> We're talking about our President of the United States. <laughs> you know, when he said, wanted, dead, or alive, that told us a lot about his thinking. But he told us a lot about where he comes from, too. You know, wanted, dead, or alive. Um, and, um, you know, it makes it difficult, then, uh, to pursue justice according to the law, then, okay? Uh, because wanted, dead, or alive bypasses the whole legal system, you know? Because after 9-11, there were people who thought, oh, you know, uh, look what we're doing with Solovovich, okay? International Tribunal, The Hague, huh? war crimes, okay? Uh, you know, but when you say wanted, dead, or alive, you're not going to go through any kind of judicial system. Um, so the culture of masculinity, um, you want long-term or just short-term <laughs> kind of solutions, okay? Like short-term would be to raise the issue, huh? Like be careful with our language because the language can then become controlling uh, even when uh, Bush used the term crusade, you know? What do you mean? Already, you know, uh, that, that uh, uh, dichotomized the world. But, but it's a good thing that the American Muslim Association criticized Bush right away. And Bush then went and visited the mosque, and his staffers said, oh, we're going to drop the term crusade from the White House lexicon. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so, you know, uh, that would be short term. I think long term, though, is that um, uh, we, we have to, like, confront our past, okay? You know, th th this is a country that celebrates masculinity. It's the frontier and all that. But the frontier meant, you know, the, the, the genocide against Native peoples here. You know, when Frederick Jackson Turner says, oh, the significance of the frontier in American history, he said, Europeans came here. They, 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 they conquered the West, and they destroyed the Indians, and they emerged as the American, okay? That's where you have this master narrative, you know, where the European becomes an American. How? Through death, okay? Through death of the wilderness and death of the inhabitants of the wilderness. Huh? Uh, so we need to, like, rethink our history to see what our history really is. You know, that would be long term, okay? And that's where it has to be in the curriculum then, okay? Where we have a more critical and more inclusive study of our past. Uh, also, oh man, you got me going here. <laughs> Long term, we've got to re redefine who we are, you know, just as, as people. Uh, wh why should we think in terms of like masculine means hard and feminine means soft, you know, and hence, you know, uh, you have to be uh, feminine or you have to be masculine. Like, Truman himself was trapped. He was a prisoner of, of, of this iron cage of masculinity. You know, it's too bad that this culture couldn't allow him to be what he was, you see? Uh, and he didn't have to think of himself as short, you know? Yeah, but this culture of masculinity to say, oh, it's tall men who are masculine, okay? Poor guy, you know, I felt sorry for this kid, you know? Yeah, but, but Truman had that possibility of becoming, um, hey, androgynous, right? That's the term, androgynous. <laughs> what do you think about that? We're all androgynous, right? We all possess, like, softness and hardness and so forth, you know? 
um, I think it's okay for, for men to be soft and to be feminine, you know? We shouldn't even call it feminine. I, I go into restaurants, you know, and I, I check in at the airport, and they say, oh, uh, Ms. Takaki, you know? Uh, or I'm in a restaurant, and they say, what can I get for you, Ms., you know? And I think, oh, that's okay, you know? They think because I have a hard time. <laughs> and then I open my mouth, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, you know? But I think, oh, that's okay, you know? Yeah, it's okay for us to be gentle, okay? Yeah, but just imagine if we had political leaders who were androgynous, huh? who could be both, you know, strong and soft. Huh? You know, I think we'd have a different kind of policy. But that would be the long term, you know, where we redefine who we are, you see. And this is where, like, feminist studies can help us. So, huh? yeah, we can, we can be both. We can be, you know, uh, we are mul multiple selves. And why don't we embrace and accept our multiple selves? Uh, so that's my answer to you. <laughs>